couple of years back, when the psychology of happiness was beginning to become popular, I was asked to review a book on the topic, to give a Buddhist perspective on the issue. And I said one of the things the book was missing was an understanding of karma. That in your pursuit for happiness, you do things that have an impact on other people and have an impact on yourself. And so you have to weigh the happiness that you get from those actions against their long-term results. And the editor of the magazine that I wrote this for said he was surprised that he focused on that as the Buddhist issue. Well, I was surprised that he was surprised. It's the principle of cause and effect is what the Buddha said lay at the heart of his awakening. Summarized his awakening in one sentence, it was a principle of when this is, that is. When this isn't, that isn't. From the rising of this comes the rising of that. From the cessation of this comes the cessation of that. And then he would expand on what that meant. But that, for him, was the essence of his awakening, and particularly the arising of this or the when this is. One of the big issues, of course, is your action, your intentions. When there are intentions, what happens? And these intentions have immediate impact, and they also have long-term impact. We have to take this into consideration as we look for happiness, because sometimes the things we do will give a short-term happiness, but then in the long term they cause trouble for ourselves and for other people. I was amazed that the book on happiness didn't consider at all how people's conception of happiness would actually impact other people. The book was trying to be scientific. It said, well, sometimes torturers and terrorists, they have their views on happiness, and who are we as objective observers to pass judgment on them? But of course you have to take into consideration the impact these things have on other people, because other people aren't going to just sit still and let you have a happiness that's going to cause them suffering. Even if they die from your efforts, they're going to come back, and their relatives are going to come back at you. That's built into the way things are. So as you look for happiness in life, as you look for pleasure, you've got to take into consideration what you're doing to get that happiness, and what the long-term impact is going to be. Pleasure, happiness, bliss, ease. The Pali word is sukha for all of those things. And as you look for sukha, what is it? It's a feeling. Feelings are fabricated. In other words, in other words even in the experiencing of a feeling, there's a certain amount of intention already. We have potentials that come in from the past, from our past actions. And then our experience of them in the present moment actually turns them into a feeling. It's what the mind spends a lot of its time creating all the time. We're doing it right here as we meditate. We've got a body that's healthy, and we have a certain amount of experience with the breath. That's the past karma we're working with. And then we're trying to use that past karma, fashion it into an experience of well-being in the present moment. And in the beginning, you focus on trying to create a sense of ease and well-being with the breath. And to get established in it, you have to indulge in it. 
that too as a type of action, type of karma. You create the feeling and then you settle in it. But the trick is that if you just simply settle in the feeling of pleasure and let go of the breath, then the pleasure is not going to last very long. John Lee's image is of a person who works and gains a salary. You keep on working, you keep on getting the salary. And you are allowed to enjoy the pleasure, because this is a blameless pleasure. The Buddha, like so many people who had, in the beginning of his life, had had a life of total indulgence. When he left the home life, went off to the other extreme. He was afraid of pleasure. He'd seen the impact of pleasure on his mind, that it made him intoxicated, blurred his understanding. So he ran off in the other direction. Total self-torture. He would go into a trance where he wouldn't allow himself to breathe, and even though it caused huge pains in the body, he just stuck with it. He would eat as little as possible. Until he would faint when he would urinate or defecate. And finally, after six years of that, he realized that this is it. This is as far as you can go in self torment. The question was could there be another way? Because this obviously wasn't getting, getting him to awakening. And he recollected the time when he was a child. Sort of naturally had entered a, the first jhana. He asked himself, could this be the way? And something inside him said, yes. If so, why am I afraid of that pleasure? Because he had lumped all pleasure together as bad. He says, is there anything blameless about it? No. It doesn't harm anybody else. It doesn't intoxicate the mind. It doesn't blur your awareness. He said, okay, this is a pleasure that I can pursue. And he realized also that he was going to have to eat if he was going to have the strength to do that. That's how he got onto the middle path, realizing that there are some pleasures whose pursuit is blameless. So that's why we're here, to develop this sense of pleasure, and then to use it further. You don't just stop with a pleasure. You try to use it as a basis for understanding the mind even further. And particularly you want to understand the issue of suffering. You want to comprehend it. That's the duty the Buddha says we have with, with regard to suffering and stress. You want to comprehend it. And you comprehend it by developing dispassion for it, knowing it so thoroughly that you become dispassionate. Ordinarily, we might not think that we have passion for suffering, but we do. So many things that we enjoy in life involve suffering and stress, and we get quite passionate about it. So you want to understand the process that you're creating a lot of unnecessary stress, a lot of unnecessary suffering, both for yourself and for other people. You see the drawbacks of that kind of attachment, that kind of passion. And the only way you're going to see those drawbacks is to give yourself a less blameless form of pleasure. So you can look at, say, sensual pleasure and not be so hungry for it. When you're hungering for it, it's got to be good. That's the attitude we have. But if you can appease that hunger for pleasure with the pleasure of a well-concentrated mind, then you can look at these other pleasures and you see they do have their drawbacks. They involve intoxication. You have to blot out large areas of your awareness if you're going to enjoy it. Like listening to a concert of music. The concert hall is designed so that you lose your awareness of other people. It's dark, everybody's supposed to be quiet. You don't want anything interfering with your experience of the music. 
So you have to blot out large areas of your awareness. That's one of the drawbacks of that kind of pleasure. The mind becomes less attuned to a lot of things and has to blot out huge areas of awareness so that it can notice what it wants to focus on. And that's a metaphor for a lot of our lives. The pleasures that we have, we have to pretend a lot of things aren't there to focus on the details that we like. And that's pleasure. And then there's pain. How do you deal with, how are you going to comprehend pain? Because for most of us, our experience with pain is that we want to push it away. We feel threatened by it. We feel in, invaded by it. And the only way you're going to be able to actually comprehend it is to have this alternative foundation for the mind, a place where you can feel at ease, can feel settled, secure. Secure enough that you can then look into the pain and not feel so threatened by it. Have a certain amount of objectivity in the way you look at it, so you can really comprehend it. Oh, pain comes from this. And this is what I've been doing to create it. So it's only when the mind has this sense of an inner security from the concentration that it can really perform the, the duty that the Buddha says we have with regard to stress, which is to comprehend it to the point of dispassion. So that's the skillful way to deal with pleasure, the skillful kind of karma around pleasure. Try to create a pleasure that's harmless, and then use that experience of pleasure for a further purpose. It's not the way we usually associate with pleasure. We like to indulge in it. It's because, of course, we like to indulge in it. We, we don't like to hear that there's karma associated with that. We want our pleasures to be free. The only pleasure that's free, though, the Buddha said, is nirvana. And even the practice of jhana requires that we have a body that's alive and needs to feed. So there is a certain amount of burdensomeness that's placed on other people, other beings. But the only true free pleasure is one that's not even a feeling. He says it's a pleasure that doesn't come under the five aggregates. It's known by a consciousness that doesn't come out of the five aggregates. That's something really special. But the only way to find that is to first develop this ability to create a sense of ease and well-being within the body through the breath. A sense of ease and well-being that come from secluding the mind from unskillful states, getting the mind concentrated. And really seeing the karma of pleasure. This is what you've got to do in order to create a sense of well-being that's relatively blameless and then can be used for the purpose of even higher pleasure, even more blameless pleasure. Free both in the sense that you don't have to pay any money for it, you don't have to do anything for it, and you're not harming anybody at all. Because it's totally outside of the patterns of cause and effect. But to get there, you have to understand how pleasure is totally, our usual experience of pleasure is totally enmeshed in cause and effect. And you have to weigh the things that you're doing to give rise to that pleasure, the things you do as a result of that pleasure, and then the impact that it has on other people. All those things have to be weighed very carefully. But when you approach the issue with wisdom and understanding, you finally can get to that thing that we that we all want, that pleasure that's totally free.
So as you go through life and find yourself consuming pleasures. Realize that there's an intentional activity even in the production of the pleasure and in the experiencing of the pleasure and the enjoyment of the pleasure. And try to get yourself as sensitive as possible to what that intention is and what its effects are. So that your attitude toward pleasure can be, become more responsible and more productive of that the path that leads to a pleasure that's totally free. <laughs>